is on. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm super excited to be here um, today and to be talking to you guys. Um, I, if, you, if you're just joining us today, we are in the middle of this series on joy. Um, and I actually, I was really excited because this, this se during this series, um, the very first talk, Matt asked us, he said, um, I think I have this up here, yes, what, if, if what area, if you could have more joy in one part of your life, what would it be? Um, yeah, it is on. It's on. It's on. See, now it's on. <laughs> there, you can hear me, right? Okay. So, um, I, it's this Britney Spears mic. It gets me every time. I just don't know. Okay. Um, so he asked us, if we could have more joy in one area of our life, what would it be? And I, I was thinking about this, and um, I am I'm a mom and a wife, and I've got three kids, and life is busy. And so one of the areas that I would love to see more joy in is just in my relationship with my husband. He's right here in the front. Um, and then as it turns out, we were really blessed this last week. Um, a friend of ours from here, Hopewell, was able to come over and watch our kids for us for the night. And that allowed us to go out. We went out to dinner. And then we went and we um, saw a presentation by this outdoor photographer named Jimmy Chin. Were any of you here or heard about him? Okay. Um, so... <laughs> Real outdoorsy crowd, you guys are. Um, so anyway, he's like this. Um, he's a National Geographic photographer. He does um, documentaries. He's like an extreme skier and climber and has done like Everest and stuff. And it was amazing because I was sitting there and I, we, these were some of the pictures that we saw. Um, and it was like... I was sitting there and I was thinking, joy, the joy of creation. And I was just gazing at these beautiful um, pictures. And then this is, that's him, I think, um, climbing on that. And, and so then I was also marveling in, like, the creativity of people and the ingenuity of people as he would describe, like, how he and his teammates would do these crazy things. They didn't, this was on the cover of, of National Geographic. Um, in Yosemite Valley. So anyway, I was really, really thankful. That's one of my stories um, of joy in this last week. I hope, I hope you guys have some stories of joy too. We'll talk some more about that later. Um, today we are actually talking about the intermingling of joy and suffering in this world. Um, so we've been looking at joy through this lens, through this lens of the story of God, the story of God's work in the world. Um, it's kind of the bigger story of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. Um, three different acts, or these different acts or movements of God in the world. Um, and jo or Matt, when he spoke, he invited us to, to reconsider our very notions of God. Does, if you were here, do you remember this? To consider whether we knew God as a joyful God. Did you do this? I, so I started that next week when I would pray, I would say, God who is joyful. Joyful God. And it really, it really was, it was uh, meaningful to me. It was a really good practice for me to address him that way. Good morning, joyful God. Right? Um, so, again, I think that this has been a really good series um, for me. He also gave us some helpful ways of thinking about joy. Um, joy as the emotion that we feel when we recognize something good as good. Right, so as I was sitting there looking at these beautiful photographs of creation and recognizing them as good, I could feel this joy in me. Um, also defined it as joy as a response to gratuity. That is joy as a response just to gift, just to generous gift, uh, whatever that might be for us. And then finally, we also heard this wonderful news that Jesus wants his joy in us. That's great news. He has joy and he wants it for us. That's found in the Gospel of John. And yet, so that was a lot of good news, and yet um, Josh reminded us last week um, as we continued in the story of joy that we actually live 
in a broken world. We can all see this. The world is marred by sin uh, and death and evil. And what we sometimes take part in is not the joy that God would have for us, but this like sinister kind of counterfeit joy. And this, this really got me. A counterfeit joy. I mean, there was like, there was like self-absorbed joy and vapid joy. Vapid joy, right? And, and perverse joy. And there are all these terrible kinds of delights that we sometimes have. And it's like not really based in true joy or rejoicing over really what is good. Um, this counterfeit joy mistakes evil for good and delights in evil, whether it is in subtly wicked ways, like in feeling a little rise over someone else's failure or mistake, or whether it's in more plainly wicked ways, like rejoicing over death and destruction. So, of course, the bad news was that we are all complicit in this. Um, But the good news that Josh shared with us is that God gives us a way out as we turn to him, um, as we repent and follow him in the way of love. And he gives us a deeper truth that we can rejoice in, that death is not the end, and that our stories, our stories, can be marked by his joyful story. So you might think we're moving right up into redemption this week. But no, we're going to hang out here just a little bit longer in the fall. Um, We wanted to take another week just in the brokenness, in the brokenness. And the reason for that is that the world is complicated. And the world is messy. And suffering is real. And it's a very real thing that some of us here who long for joy in our lives are not experiencing it. And rather, we might be in a season of pain or a season of suffering, a season of sorrow. Um, and so for those of us who are in that season of life, um, I, just want, I just want you to know that, that you're seen, too, um, to acknowledge that path that you're walking right now. Um, And to also say that I long for Jesus, the one who has joy and who wants to share it, to be with you and to be with us today. I really want to take him up on his promise for myself and for all of us. Um, And especially for those of us whose lives feel devoid of joy or even devoid of the possibility of joy these days. I also think there could be folks here who, while they may not be in a season of suffering or hardship themselves right now, are just carrying the sorrows of others, um, who might be feeling the weight of the hurt or injustice in communities, in our nation, in the world. Um, And I want to see you as well today and to see what paths to joy um, that God might have for you also. So... That's what we're doing today. This is kind of where we've been for the last couple weeks um, and what we're going to be looking at. What are those paths to joy that we can choose to walk, even in a broken world, in a world marred um, by sin and by sorrow? Where are the places where we can cultivate joy and see it grow in our lives? So um, before we go any further, I'm just going to pray. And if you are... And pray with me, <laughs> and especially if you're here um, and you're one of those folks who, who, who we're just saying, you know, I'm not experiencing joy in my life. I'm in a season of sorrow. Um, I just invite you to, to pray along with me. So God, um, we, we know that there's, there is a lot to rejoice over, and yet we also know um, that there is there is a lot of sorrow and suffering in this world. So Lord, right now, uh, we ask for your presence. We ask for your power, for your words, and that you would um, cause joy to spring up among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um. 
When it comes to the topic of joy in the midst of a broken world and in the midst, midst of suffering and pain, um, I'm, I'm definitely not going to stand up here and say that I have all the answers. Um, so I approach this with a lot of tenderness, but I also have a lot of confidence in a God um, who does long to bring joy into our lives. This idea came to me that there might be paths of joy, like choices that we can make or ways that we can walk along in this world that cultivate joy, that sort of till the ground so that joy can grow. And I feel like, I think this is true because I know it's true with love, right? Um, even though love can be an emotion, right? I don't wake up every morning. My husband and I just celebrated our 19th wedding anniversary. And we will tell you... <laughs> We will tell you that the way that love grows, I mean, some mornings, yes, you wake up with an overwhelming feeling of love, but, uh, but then some mornings you don't. Um, and then what happens is you walk in paths of sacrifice and kindness. Like that's where you choose to walk and that's what you choose to kind of cultivate. And then what happens is that love emerges along those paths. And that's how you tend to it. Um, and, I, and, and you kind of give room for love to grow and see it emerge. And, I, and so I started wondering if something similar might be the case, uh, might be said of joy. So I was looking at scriptures where I could see sort of these two elements, um, rejoicing and suffering. I was thinking more about what Josh and Matt had shared with us. Um, and I do think that we already have heard kind of one of these paths of joy, and that's really the path of gratitude. I think that when Matt spoke with us about the joy of creation and calling what is good, good, um, that that's actually, um, and, and response to gratuity, that that is a path of gratitude. That is a place where we leave room for joy to grow in our lives. Um, and so I think that that's one path already that we have. And then also as I was looking through more of the scriptures where I could see joy and suffering together or people who were experiencing suffering also say that they were rejoicing at the same time. There are a few other paths that I saw. Um, the path of perspective. This is what I'm going to call them. Okay, these are just my words. They're not like, you know, don't write these down or anything. The path of perspective. Um, so this is just choosing a way of seeing. And Josh talked about this a little bit last week also in his teaching on a way of seeing that God can give us. The path of people. Um, so what that means is choosing a path that it's alongside others. Choosing a path that's in community. And the path of presence. And so choosing a path that's marked. Um, by the presence of God. And these are some of the verses kind of on my mind as I was thinking about this. Um, these are all from the New Testament where people, they're kind of early followers of Jesus. They're dealing with a lot of suffering. Um, but they're also like their lives are just marked by joy. And if you read through some of these letters and some of the accounts of the early church, um, you'll see this. So this is one um, where Paul, a church planner, is describing this community of faith. He says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Um, I think there's something there that, about um, what the Holy Spirit does as well, his presence. Here's another one. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. I think here we see kind of that future sense, this new way of seeing, of looking, a different kind of vision, and also being with Christ in his sufferings. We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. goes on to say that hope does not disappoint because of the Holy Spirit who's been poured out into our lives. And again, we see this future vision. This is building into something more and that the Holy Spirit is also present with us. This is from the book of James. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking, not lacking anything. Here I started to see, oh, yeah, I guess the idea that suffering isn't where this ends. This isn't the end of the story. 
And even the words from Jesus, I don't have these up here, but blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. What is, what is this perspective that can allow us to leap for joy um, in the face of this kind of, of suffering? So this first, this path of perspective, and I think this is just how we adjust our vision. One of the things that I think all of these verses point to um, is that there's something beyond the suffering, right, that's going to inform our present reality. And in so doing, it doesn't change the suffering, but it gives it different meaning. And I think this is part of what Josh was talking about last week when he talked about this anchoring work, this way that we anchor ourselves and our stories in a bigger story, in a deeper power, and in a different perspective. When we see that our suffering is not the end, that our suffering is not the only force at work in this world, I was thinking of calling this like the joy of vision or hopeful joy because it really has this kind of forward-looking, bigger picture sense of things. And if you look at some of those verses, you can see that what is hoped for is not yet realized or seen. It's, in, it's far off in some cases. The hope of heaven, the hope of maturity, <laughs> perseverance, even seeing the glory of God. But all of this somehow gives cause for rejoicing. And I think that this is a path that we can choose to walk in and a path that we can ask God to help us with and a vision that we need. In my work, both as a family pastor and also I work as a childbirth educator and doula, and so I'm often at the side um, of new parents um, in the throes of sleep deprivation, right? Some of you, I have been with you in the throes of sleep deprivation um, with their newborns. And just raise your hand if you have ever been sleep deprived. So like every student should raise your hand also, right? And if, and like the students who didn't raise your hand, it's because you are currently sleep deprived and you just don't even know it because like you've lost all sense of the world around you and reality. But that's what happens to us when we are sleep deprived, right? I'm right about this. So, um, so the thing that I know happens, like with parents of newborns is, when I'm sitting with them, um, is that when you're in it, you, you, you think that you've always been there. Like even though your baby's four days old, you're like, I'm pretty sure my whole life has felt this bad right now. And there's nothing else. And this is all there will ever be. Um, I see some parents kind of going, yes, yes, in the back. Um, and, and you, you think that, and I, I sometimes wonder, like, how to assure parents that, like, when your child goes off to college, they will be sleeping more than one and a half hours at a time through the night, hopefully. I mean, most of us did. It will not last the length of your child's life. But the thing about sleep deprivation, maybe this is true for other kinds of suffering as well, is that when you're in the midst of it, you lose perspective, Right? You just lose it. You lose all sight that this is like this much time in a life like this big and in an eternity that large. Um, perspective matters, right? Being able to place ourselves in a story, being able to see rightly where we are um, makes a big difference in us being able to hope for something beyond Right? For be, us being able to even have joy, rejoice in where we are. Rejoice and be glad when you face, many, face trials of many kinds. Now one thing I want to say about this verse because it has been meaningful to me in my life. This is not the kind of counterfeit joy um, that Josh talked about last week. This is not like delight in those evil things that are happening to you. This is not delight in evil. I really want to make sure you hear that. Um, when I was a young person, alcoholism was present in my family. And I was told by several really well-meaning people um, to rejoice in my suffering. And what I heard was to rejoice over this terrible and destructive force that was wreaking havoc in my life and the lives of my loved ones. And I, I said, I will not 
I will not rejoice. Um, I was really mad about that. Um, because this, and this is not that. This is not joy that comes from evil. This is actually joy that can like stare down evil, right? This is joy that can stare it down because it knows its end will come. This is joy that resists evil and says there is a stronger good. Knows that the final word rests with God. And we choose a vision of the unseen. We choose a vision of the not yet. I think another path is this path of people. And this is the path we walk in community. Um, that we make room for joy as we enter courageously into community with others. And if you thought that the path of perspective was a courageous one, let me just tell you, the path of people is even more courageous. Because it takes even more courage because this is where you, um, this is the place where you share your life with others, which can feel like a really scary and vulnerable thing to do. But the scripture calls us to rejoice with those who rejoice and to mourn with those who mourn. And it seems that what this is telling us is that joy can be shared. That joy is not just a private experience and a personal experience that I have, but that it's shared with others and that it's experienced together. And even that I can take part in your joy and you can take part in mine. We take part in one another's celebrations. We call what is good, good in another person's life. And again, this comes against that counterfeit joy, right, that would try to sell us on rejoicing in another's failure or misery or weakness rather than their victory or their gladness, or their strength. Because that counterfeit joy wants us to believe that I can't celebrate another's good because that might mean less for me. Or that I simply cannot celebrate good in the midst of suffering. And that's just not true. When we celebrate another's good without fear for ourselves, we courageously place our trust in God and we take part in each other's joy and in God's joy and calling what is good, good. I want us to be a community that does that for one another. I want us to celebrate together everything <laughs> from birthdays to weddings to graduations to you name it because that is choosing to call what is good, good together. And that's another reason why sharing our stories of joy is so important. I had someone this week email me a story of celebration in her life. Um, how she had seen God work over a number of years through a very difficult and dark time and how she saw the emergence of joy over time. I cried as I read it, tears of joy, because it, I was so thankful and happy to be able to share in her joy with her. So let's do that for one another. Have you ever felt like, oh, I want to say this, but no, maybe I won't. Like, what stops us from doing that? What stops us from sharing the joy in our lives? For me, sometimes, it's just like, oh, maybe this is silly. It's not really that big a deal. I mean, when you think of, like, the, all the stuff that's going on in the world and people's lives, I don't want to share this. But do you see how then we rob one another of this joy and of experience and saying, no, this is good. We're going to call that good together. So please share. <laughs> share with each other. Share with the staff. We love to hear. Um, but let's be a community that calls what is good, good. Because somehow being in a community with one another gives us access to joy in a different way even if myself, even if I myself am suffering. But that's not all this verse says, right? It also calls us to mourn with those who mourn. So this is also the path that means that if I'm in a place of suffering and I choose to celebrate alongside others, that means that, I, that others also come alongside me in my mourning when we choose to walk a path with other people. 
we actually are meant to be people who mourn loss together and we grieve together. We don't just come together to celebrate and then scurry home to mourn alone. We need to do both. And if you've been with us in our community for a while, that you know, then you know that we have been in seasons of lament together. Seasons where we have been taking time to just mourn together and to lament some of the, the wider injustices and evils that we see in communities and our nation and the world. I really think we're meant to suffer together. It's good news, people. Uh, we're meant to suffer together. And I think that is good news because even when researchers look at, at folks who are nearing, they're approaching the end of their lives, they find that people are not so much afraid, they're not afraid of death and they're not even so much afraid of pain, but they're terrified of experiencing any of it alone. That's what really scares them. And I think there's a reason for that. I think we're called by God to be a people who join together both in mourning and in celebrating. And my hunch is that by sharing together in these times and experiences with one another, we again, we're standing in a place, we're walking that path where joy can emerge. I think Paul, if you read the New Testament, you'll, you'll come across this fellow Paul quite a bit. He's very wordy. And... Um, he was a church planner in the early church and someone who had encountered Jesus in a very significant way. And he displays this so often in his letters to communities of believers. I won't put up all that he says because there's just too many examples. Um, but you can go home and look through some of his letters where he talks about his sufferings. And there were many sufferings that he experienced. I'm talking like shipwrecked you know, thrown overboard, like bat, beaten, stoned, left for dead, thrown in jail. He, ha he encountered a lot of suffering. Um, but then as he writes to these communities, he tells them of how he's rejoicing alongside them, of how much the goodness that he sees in their lives has brought joy to his own. He chooses to call good, good in their lives and he shares in their joy with them in the midst of very troubling circumstances for himself. I think he's, he's a great example to me. I think another path that we can walk is this path of presence. Um, because I think that there are places of suffering in this world that are just so very deep. And so I think that there, our greatest hope is the presence of Jesus. It's, he's the one who the scripture says is acquainted with sorrows, who weeps with the bereaved, who knows the pain of betrayal, who endures great suffering himself, and who gives us his spirit. And do you know what the spirit of Jesus is called? <laughs> The spirit of Jesus is called the comforter, the one who comes alongside, who leads us into truth. And so whether we are walking a path of gratitude or that path of perspective or a path together with people in mourning and celebration, I think we need this presence most of all. I think we need the presence of the spirit, of the one who holds joy. I think we want and need this one to be our companion in seasons of suffering. Several years ago, um, my husband, Rob, he's right here, um, was diagnosed with stage 3 colon cancer. Um, he is now, thanks be to God, in remission and quite healthy. <laughs> um, but those years of sickness and treatment um, and then the subsequent effects of treatment were really painful and difficult. Looking back at that season now, we sometimes are struck by the pain and the difficulty. In fact, sometimes now we even have to stop and just say, that was so hard. Do you remember what that was like? That was so hard. But I have to tell you um, that there was a joy that emerged as well. I think we did 
walk in some of these paths like I've been talking about. I remember one day driving home from, it was like one of the walk for a cure, cancer, um, fundraise, hope, relay for life, something like this, yes. And we were driving home, Rob had been the speaker. He was in the middle of treatment. He had like got up and shared a few words and I was still in this place of like denial where I'm like, you're not a cancer patient. I was, I'm like, you just have a tumor that's cancerous. Like let's <laughs> just, you don't, you're not, can, like, I just had this really hard time. So he was really patient with me. He's like, yes, yes, Asha, you can just call it a cancerous tumor if you'd like. Um, he's like, but I have cancer. And I'm like, no, no, you have a cancerous tumor. Like I just, um, so anyway, it was this really strange time for, for me to process through this. But I remember we were driving home um, and, and we started talking about how we thought we would look back on these years. It was a really interesting conversation to start to have. And um, I remember us asking ourselves like, Huh, so is this like marking a whole new reality for us? Is this what this season is? Or is this marking a season that's going to end in loss? Is that what this is? Or would it just be like this blip in our lives that kind of came and went and we'd have to kind of go, oh yeah, remember when that happened? <laughs> wow. We started wondering like how, what would be the bigger perspective that we would see what would be the bigger context in which we would place this moment in time? We were asking what was God doing and where would we see him? And I think we were choosing to believe that there was more going on than we could see. Um, that his story of cancer was even part of a larger story that God was writing in our lives and even part of a larger story of God, that cancer didn't have the final say, that God was greater and that he was good. We chose to invite others to mourn with us. I remember the day we called together friends to tell them the news after we'd heard the results of the biopsy, to cry and to pray with us we knew we weren't meant to do it alone. That God had called us to community. <laughs> I'm gonna do this. I would call people over just to sit with Rob at his bedside when he was too weak to do much of anything else. And they faithfully came. A lot of you are in this room. And they were willing to mourn with us and willing to sit with us in our pain. And Rob's pain didn't stop him from celebrating with others, <laughs> for cheering on his favorite sports teams, or his, or his friends out running when he couldn't run anymore. We have um, annual barbecues in our backyard, and Rob is, you know, he'll, he stands for hours manning the grill and for a couple of years there, he couldn't do it. Um, but he would choose to come out of the house and sit and celebrate for a while. Um, and then retreat back inside to rest while his friends gladly manned the grill for him. He even flew to California to celebrate alongside old high school classmates for their 20th high school reunion. I think that these were paths of perspective and paths of people paths that opened the way for joy to also be present. And if you ask Rob about times in his life where he has experienced the presence of God so strongly, he will tell you about a night in the hospital when he woke in great pain. So much pain there were just tears streaming from his eyes. And he will tell you about crying out to God. And then he will tell you of a choice he made to sing. He chose to sing that night in his darkened hospital room with no one else around but the Spirit of God hovering above him 
and he will tell you that he continued to cry, but that mingled with the tears of pain, there were tears of joy as he encountered a God who would never leave him and would never cease to be powerful and good. You had to go and sit in the front row, huh? <laughs> if you'd been back there, I could have done this. <sighs> Suffering is real in this world. Um, but I do think that there is joy for the brokenhearted. I really do. And I want us to be people who cry out with the psalmist, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Our lives, our lives that hold sorrow and pain, may they also hold gratitude. May they also hold vision and community and the presence of God because then I think they are also vessels of joy. The worship team can start coming back up here. <laughs> I want us to reflect on some questions um, also. One, where do you need God to give you a new vision or perspective? Are you in that place of sleep deprivation and you can't see anything else? And you can't remember another time and you can't imagine what it, would, it could look like on the other side. Right? That is a place to ask for vision. Secondly, whose joy are you entering into right now? Where are you celebrating? And where are you sharing your joy with others? It doesn't matter how big or how small are you sharing that joy with others. Can you come alongside others in their mourning? Have you invited others to be in sorrow with you? And let me just note here that th I'm talking about real human contact, not like sending emojis to each other, right? Because social media has its place and that can be a gift, but it's not the same. It's not the same as rejoicing um, with those who are rejoicing and mourning with those who mourn. Sometimes it can, it can rob us of actually being with each other. And the third thing is just to ask and look for his presence. Um, I, like I said at the beginning, my hope is that that, that God, <laughs> that God who holds joy, that he has, a play, he has a path for all of us here today and especially for those who are brokenhearted, I'm going to go ahead and say this. I think God has a special place for you in his heart. Psalm 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He just is. Um, so I want that to be an encouragement to us today if we are among those who, who say we are brokenhearted. We're going to take some time to respond, and I hope just to be in the presence of God. One of the things that we do and one of the ways that we can walk some of these paths together is in communion where we do remember a bigger story where we mourn the suffering and death of Jesus and where we also celebrate his risen life and we invite that same life and presence to be in us so I invite you um, to come and to tear off a piece of the bread, his body broken for you, and to dip it in the juice, Jesus' blood shed for you, and to take in the life of Jesus, um, because we know that it's Jesus um, who, while his life was marked by suffering, he also had a joy set before him. And may it be yours as well.